that, that he can answer some questions uh, we put to him arising from this uh, fascinating film, uh, The Man Who Is Tall Is Happy. Uh, no, welcome. Yeah, to be with you. Uh, I think you can see that we have an appreciative audience uh, that uh, has found something very interesting in this film and moreover is fascinated by your own reflections. Uh, Noam, I, I would like just to start off uh, by asking a few questions uh, and then I've got some questions from the members of the audience. Um, I wanted to ask first that sort of somehow between the beginning and end of the film, uh, there's quite an emphasis on education. And you, in particular, uh, talk about the primary school that you attended that was Deweyite, uh, I think you described it as. And I wonder whether you think that the Deweyite principles, the principles of John Dewey, the American pragmatist philosopher, did they have some sort of influence on you whether you read him or not, because of this educational background, and, and perhaps did you reproduce some of this with your own children, which is something you discuss their education at the end of the film? Well, I, I don't doubt that the, um, first of all, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? through? Yes. yes. Okay, coming, good. So yeah. clear. Okay. Uh, I don't doubt that the uh, early educational experience had uh, a quite a substantial uh, impact on uh, my thinking, um, development, uh, attitudes towards things, and uh, hence indirectly uh, Dewey had an influence since uh, he was uh, um, the person who inspired the basic structure of the educational system. I should say later when I was a teacher, um, I sort of worked my way through college teaching uh, Hebrew school, and we taught on Deweyite principles quite explicitly. Uh, so I had experience also as a teacher using these, and uh, I can't doubt that that transferred over to the way we handle our own children. So my wife actually went through the same experiences. Uh, that's very interesting. I want to ask another uh, aspect, uh, about another aspect of your upbringing, and that is, uh, I believe from other writings and, and interviews of yours that you had a, an intensely political home background uh, and that the predominant influence was anarchism. And I wanted to ask whether there's something in that anarchist tradition that also appears in your work or, or helped you to um, really reconcile yourself to um, allowing quite a lot of chaos and complexity. Uh, you didn't seem to be frightened by the absence of higher authorities. Uh, you're, you're quite confident to set out by yourself. Well, as I, uh, anarchism is a term that is used uh, very broadly by anarchists as well. But uh, what I believe to be the uh, sort of core uh, principle that runs through the diverse anarchist traditions is that uh, structures of nomination of any kind, uh, hierarchical authoritarian structures, structures in which someone gives orders and others follow them, uh, all such structures uh, uh, are illegitimate until proven otherwise, meaning they have a burden of proof to bear. They have to show that they're legitimate. Uh, otherwise, they should be dismantled. Uh, that's true uh, whether you're talking about uh, the sovereign in international affairs, uh, the uh, CEO of a corporation, the manager of a corporation who's giving orders to workers, uh, a patriarchal family in which the uh, uh, father figure is uh, domineering the others and so on. At any level, all such structures have to demonstrate their legitimacy. And if they can't, they should be dismantled. 
uh, typically they can't. That's very common. Uh, occasionally you can give a justification for them, but they have the burden of proof. And uh, yes, that I think uh, consciously, consciously in this case carries over to the uh, kinds of domains that you're referring to, and I think should be a guideline for everyone. Uh, I couldn't help thinking that in the account you give of your ideas uh, in the film, uh, the, the different generations appear, the parent generation, the child generation, perhaps more than two generations, I don't know. Uh, I had the impression that innovation uh, doesn't just come uh, from the old and wise, or and it doesn't just come from the naive wisdom of the child, but somehow there's an interaction to do with the fixed attributes of our intelligence, that um, somehow the small changes made by the parent generation are seen in a more systematic way by the child generation. Did, did I get that right, or have I um, well, I think explained there's, that? there's plenty of interaction. Uh, uh, any parent uh, should be aware that you can learn from your children. Uh, the uh, Another great figure in modern educational theory, Paulo Freire, uh, once described the education, uh, teach, the teaching teacher-student relation as a mutual relationship. Uh, they're learning from each other. Uh, it's an interaction in which one learns from the other. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, I happen to have just come 15 minutes ago from a graduate seminar uh, where I happen to be lecturing, and uh, it's exactly what happens. Uh, hope, one hopes the students learn from you, but you learn from them. Uh, if it's not an interactive environment, there's something wrong with it. And I think that's true uh, down to the level of uh, nursery school and uh, your own children, grandchildren, and in my case, grand, great-grandchild. Uh, it's a constant process of interactive relationship, uh, new insights coming from all directions, uh, corrections coming from above and below. And in fact, in general, the a goal should be to try to the extent possible to uh, attenuate and if possible eliminate the very concept of above and below. Uh, it's true that there are some, as I said, some hierarchical relations which can find a justification, but they have to uh, demonstrate that. So for example, if I'm walking with my, uh, say my great-grandchild uh, in the streets and uh, he runs into the street and I grab his arm and pull him back, that's an authoritarian relation, but I think you can give a justification for it. And sometimes you can, I think it's a, a much harder than is generally assumed. We should not take such relations for granted in the educational domain either. Uh, as Freire rightly pointed out, I think uh, the teacher-student relation should be a mutual one. Um, and what role is played in this by the fixed attributes? Uh, I think you sometimes use the term black box. Uh, the, the fact that we are all, both the parent and child generation, are both limited in this way. Does this affect the relationship between the two, the two or more generations? Yes, and uh, it, it, I mean, there are both institutional and conventional and, and natural structures that we're embedded in, uh, but we should be open-minded enough to uh, question them and ask uh, whether we should uh, conform to them or whether we should modify them. So yes, there are always going to be such limitations coming from many directions, and uh, one question that should be constantly in the back of our minds, you can't think of it at every moment, is, uh, but, it, but when a, a point of tension arises, it should always ask, yes, uh, am I right in accepting this position of uh, whether it's authority or subordination? Um, does um, the capacity, the infinite capacity to um, appreciate uh, patterns, is that something which um, uh, contributes to this process? 
Well, we have a, an infinite capacity, but remember that doesn't mean a boundless capacity. Infinite and boundless are quite different things. We have undoubtedly infinite cognitive capacities uh, which uh, reveal themselves in every aspect of our uh, mental lives and behavior. Uh, there are also uh, uh, intrinsic limits to it, and that's an interesting topic in itself. But uh, that's, you know, everything we do is shaped by the uh, internal uh, structures and patterns that are available to us. Uh, quite often, uh, they are much narrower than the ones that are in principle available to us. Uh, that's what uh, uh, learning is, finding that I can break these bounds and go beyond and still be within my cognitive capacities. There's sometimes when you can't break the bounds, we are, after all, uh, organic creatures, not angels. Um, I, I wonder if I could ask you about um, the status and the present condition of, of linguistics, the a discipline to which you've devoted much of your life. Uh, I mean, at some points in the film, you imply that it's still quite backward, and you say we haven't even really got to Galileo yet. Um, on the other hand, there is a sense in which linguistics, I mean, there have been major breakthroughs. Uh, uh, I mean, others can say, and uh, you know, you yourself have, uh, have often provided some of the most decisive of those breakthroughs in recent decades. But um, the, the, uh, uh, it, it seems that linguistics, even though perhaps not fully developed uh, as some other sciences, uh, some other subsections and disciplines, uh, that uh, it exercises a peculiar fascination for very large numbers of people. Uh, your own work has had an impact far outside the ranks just of uh, linguists. Uh, and um, your ideas, including uh, as we've heard them expressed and, and marvelously illustrated in the film, uh, they, they seem to exercise a peculiar fascination because words are so important to us. Language is so important to us, to who we are, how, how we behave. And uh, is there a sense in which Lingu linguistics is always going to have difficulty being quite as precise, perhaps, as physics or geometry. But um, it still uh, is, because of the importance of the topics it's dealing with, uh, it still inspires great uh, fascination and interest. Well, I think uh, there's very little doubt that, uh, as uh, many thinkers have pointed out over the ages, uh, Darwin, others, uh, language is the uh, most striking uh, uh, characteristic of human beings, the characteristic that uh, sharply distinguishes us from every other uh, organism known. Uh, there is no other organism that has anything remotely comparable to the human capacity for language. Uh, that's been, I think, demonstrated quite dramatically in the uh, uh, heroic and intriguing uh, efforts to train our closest relatives, uh, the higher apes, uh, to uh, uh, emulate some aspects of uh, linguistic behavior. I think it's fair to conclude that those have been an almost total failure. I could go through some details. Uh, but uh, And it's very likely that this capacity which uh, we have is uh, a very recent one in evolutionary time that it developed uh, millions of years after separation from any other surviving creature. Uh, furthermore, it's shared among all humans. Uh, there's very strong reason to believe that all existing humans uh, have essentially the same linguistic capacities, in fact, cognitive capacities generally. I mean, this is pathology aside. Uh, in the normal case. So for example, uh, if you take a child from a, a tribe in uh, Papua New Guinea, a tribe that's been separated from other living humans for tens of thousands of years, 
And if that child is brought up, uh, say, where I am right now in Cambridge, Massachusetts, from infancy, uh, the child will be indistinguishable in linguistic and other cognitive capacities from uh, other children raised here, and conversely. Uh, that seems to be true across the species, uh, which means that since humans emerged from Africa, relatively small numbers of them, maybe roughly 50, 60,000 years ago, there's been essentially no evolutionary change. We're all cognitively identical, linguistically identical, radically different from other species. Uh, uh, it's hard to find any aspect of uh, human life and existence as uh, stri striking and salient and this, as this one as a distinctive uh, feature of humans. So yes, it does have a special fascination. And as far as progress in the field is concerned, it has been quite remarkable. So I mentioned that I just came from a seminar. The, the questions that students are working on questions that they're asking, the results that they're finding, are things that the questions, it couldn't have even been imagined uh, 50 years ago, uh, many of them 20 years ago. Uh, those are signs of major progress, uh, much more so than in other disciplines that I know of outside of the core hard sciences. Uh, that's a pretty striking fact about linguistics. Uh, nevertheless, I, I would still argue that it has not yet reached its, you might call it, Galilean stage. Uh, that is the stage where the science is for uh, the, the great Galilean breakthrough, I think, was the recognition that uh, the phenomena of nature are not the topic of our inquiry. They are data for our inquiry. What we are trying to do is to discover the uh, principles, the hidden principles that lie behind them uh, one modern physicist, great physicist, a Nobel laureate, once described the essence of science as uh, the discovery of uh, simple invisibles that lie behind the complex visibles. And I think that traces back to the Galilean moment in the history of the sciences. Of course, you know, didn't begin from de novo from nothing, but uh, there was a real uh, significant change in that period, I think, that has led to the modern sciences. Uh, so, for example, uh, the fact that, uh, say, um, in modern physics, uh, the fact that uh, you can't uh, yet find uh, maybe 80% uh, of the mass energy in the universe does not uh, physicists do not conclude from that, okay, let's throw everything away, it's all a failure, we give up. But in the uh, social and behavioral sciences, attitudes like that are quite common. Uh, how, how can, you constantly ask, uh, how can it be that after, you know, maybe 50 years, uh, we still don't have a complete grammar of any language? Uh, that totally misconceives the problem. It's even, uh, the uh, anything that complicated, first of all, it's not even a task that's worth pursuing. What we want to pursue, what we ought to want to pursue in the Galilean style is an effort to discover the leading principles, the simple hidden invisibles that lie behind fundamental properties of this uh, extremely uh, complex activity that we're carrying out. Uh, to, just to give a a, a, an account of all the phenomena would be, a, a, first of all, a kind of a meaningless effort, but a pointless activity. The phenomena themselves, we should understand, I think, are nothing other than the data that we encourage us, uh, often data that we uh, create by experimental situations. Uh, to lead us to um, what the fundamental principles are. So, for example, Galileo was criticized by the, uh, uh, the funders of the day, you know, the National Science Foundation of the day, namely the aristocrats, uh, for uh, studying such questions as uh, what a, uh, uh, how a ball uh, would roll down a frictionless plane. 
why study that absurd thing? It doesn't even exist in nature. Why not study how flowers grow, let's say, or how uh, uh, leaves uh, flutter in the wind? Uh, and the, and the, he was right. We should be trying to inquire into the deep abstract principles which we can only find often in uh, created environments. That's why modern science is based on experiments, a creation of artificial environments which abstract away from the complexities of the phenomena of the world. That's the way you get to understand the phenomena of the world. But that conception is pretty foreign to uh, most uh, disciplines outside the hard sciences. And uh, uh, the th that carries over t to a substantial extent to linguistics. In that sense, I think we still have not sufficiently made a breakthrough to what we can call the uh, Galilean revolution in uh, modern science. That, despite the fact that there's tremendous progress being made, as I said, the discussion that we had in class today would have been totally unintelligible, say, when I was a student uh, or even 20 years ago. It's a statement, uh, no, which I think could almost provide the basis of another film. We do have some more questions, but just before turning it over to the questions from members of the audience, there's a final question I would like to put to you, um, really on the political plane of the world that we find ourselves in just at the moment. Uh, the, the British Parliament has been debating today a motion uh, that would uh, approve and is likely to be approved the bombing of uh, Syria, uh, sorry, the bombing of Iraq, uh, excluding for the present time Syria, not including Syria for the present time. I want to ask you about this because there's, you've devoted much of your life uh, to arguing, taking courageous and unpopular decisions um, and positions on world events. And um, uh, also, it's a rather extraordinary event that we now see uh, with the statement of your president, of Barack Obama, and, and of David Cameron, the British Prime Minister. Uh, they've changed their position from just two months ago. Um, they seem to have um, cut, uh, some, something has happened. Uh, I think the shock tactics of, uh, uh, of ISIS or ISIL, uh, in particular, the resort to beheading, somehow there was a perception that things were very that there was big problems uh, uh, in the Middle East. There, were, there was the Israeli bombardment of uh, Gaza. Uh, there was the killing of 1,800 people and four or 500 children in Gaza. I don't think there was any case. The Israeli army can behave in a barbaric fashion, but it doesn't do beheadings, I don't think. Uh, somehow, by doing beheading, the um, ISIS psychologically seems to have uh, achieved a breakthrough. It, it's sort of shocked, and it, it perhaps is getting, it's persuading somehow uh, the Western government to behave in the way it wants to, them to behave, uh, uh, embarking on further rounds of military escalation, each of which has proved in the past to be a mistake. Uh, I, I somehow obscurely feel that your, the concept you were using there in the film of psychic uh, continuity, that somehow to see someone beheaded, I mean, I, I think it is a very terrible and shocking sort of sign, and that it um, uh, is, somehow it seems to have altered uh, the balance of politics. Uh, at any rate, I just want to conclude uh, my queries to you by asking whether you have any uh, immediate uh, explanation or account of what is going on uh, uh, and in the new positions of the American government and, and perhaps British government. Well, the question of the um, reaction to the beheadings is a very interesting one. Uh, actually, there were beheadings. 
uh, quite a number of them in the uh, bombing, recent bombing of Gaza, uh, but they were done in the Western way, high-tech uh, attacks from a distance. So if you look at what happened in, say, uh, Shfaya district of Gaza, where the intensive uh, uh, bombing was of civilian areas, uh, people were picking up body parts afterwards. They were trying to put together body parts to find out who was killed and so on. We all read about that in the newspapers, but it didn't shock us the way the beheading of an Algerian, of a journalist in Algeria did yesterday. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, what's the difference? And if you look at, uh, let's say, uh, President Obama is uh, running the uh, largest global terrorism campaign in history. I mean, it's a global assassination campaign uh, when you're smashed to pieces by uh, uh, an attack from a drone. Uh, it may turn out that there are body parts scattered around, but that's not beheading. Uh, this is an assassination campaign which is determined in the Oval Office, the Office of the President. Uh, I think it's by now every Tuesday morning. Uh, the high officials get together and say, uh, who is guilty? Guilty has a special meaning in the West. It means uh, targeted for assassination. That makes you guilty. So who is guilty? And uh, we now have confirmation from high officials that uh, guilty means uh, military age men congregating in certain places. Uh, the, the Attorney General, uh, um, uh, Eric Holder, just resigned yesterday, is now being uh, praised as a great civil libertarian. Uh, he and his office explained that those who are assassinated do receive due process, a notion that goes back to Magna Carta 800 years ago. Uh, you're supposed to be Receive, to be tried, if, if you're suspected of a crime, you're supposed to be uh, uh, tried with due process by a jury of your peers, uh, uh, which reaches a verdict, and then maybe uh, your sentence. And he was asked, well, does assassination in the drone campaigns uh, satisfy the condition of due process? And he said, yes, we discuss it in the White House carefully before uh, King John would have uh, nodded in approval, he would have thought that's marvelous. Now we've now abandoned the principles that he was forced to sign. Uh, and incidentally, this only arose in the case of an American citizen who was killed. For non-citizens, uh, they're what uh, George Orwell called unpeople. They're fair game. You want to break, uh, smash them to pieces, uh, uh, scatter parts of their body around with high-tech weapons, uh, that's perfectly okay. We don't care about that. Uh, so the difference, I think, is uh, essentially what, uh, I think that's the core difference, uh, what Orwell mentioned, people versus unpeople, uh, worthy victims versus unworthy victims. Uh, for us, uh, the victims of our high-tech, uh, remote uh, control, uh, long-distance uh, massacre operations, uh, those don't shock us. So the body parts scattered in the Shafaya district didn't shock us. Uh, on the other hand, the weapons of the weak, they do shock us because they're supposed to be subordinate. They do not have the rights that we have. Uh, put it in a different frame. Uh, if you study political science or you know, learn about the notion of state power and so on, uh, there is a criterion for state power. Uh, the state has a monopoly of violence in a certain territory. That's what tells you when you have a functioning state in the post barbarian conception. Well, there's also a similar conception which is not articulated in the international domain. The international sovereign, the ruler of the world, is supposed to have a monopoly of force. Well, who's the ruler of the world? The United States and its uh, the loyal subordinate Britain. They're supposed to have a monopoly of force. So when they carry out huge atrocities, when they radically violate international law, that's not a problem because they're the sovereign. They have a monopoly of force. When their victims carry out atrocities, that's a problem. They're not, they're the, supposed to be the, um, they're the unpeople. They're not allowed to carry out on a 
small scale, what we carry out on a major scale. Uh, you mentioned Obama's uh, 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 speech at the United Nations. What's interesting is what he didn't say. He did not, he spoke at the Security Council. He did not ask the Security Council uh, to determine uh, that there is a threat to peace in Iraq and to determine that's uh, under Article 39 of the UN Charter, that is the responsibility of the Security Council, and not of the British Parliament, and not of president, the President of the United States, of the Security Council. Uh, he did not ask the United Nations further to declare that there is not only a threat of peace, but to authorize the use of force uh, to deal with this threat of peace as the United Nations alone is entitled to do, not the United Nations, but its Security Council. Standing before the Security Council, Obama never occurred to him, I'm sure, to ask uh, the uh, Security Council to pursue uh, the principles of international law that are supposed to be the foundation of our own contemporary legal order. Uh, he didn't rather, he assumed, and I presume the debate in Parliament assumed, that the US and Britain are rogue states. Principles of law do not apply to them. Uh, they are the sovereigns. They have the monopoly of force and the right to use them. And therefore, questions do not arise about this. Uh, the, the fact that uh, in the United States, the UN Charter is in fact the supreme law of the land under Article Six of the Constitution but President Obama is not uh, criticized for violating uh, the constitutional requirement to observe the supreme law of the land. That question doesn't arise. We have the right to determine if there's a threat to peace and to decide how to act to respond to what we call a threat to peace. Uh, we even have the right, and this is pretty amazing when you think about it, uh, the first day of the bombing of Syria uh, was an attack on a group called Khorasan, which nobody had heard of before. And they were charged with perhaps plotting, perhaps plotting some, t some time in the future to harm us, okay? So, so therefore, they can be blown away. If someone is uh, suspected of planning to harm us sometime in the future, we're entitled to blow them away. Is that right reciprocal? Um, do others have the right uh, to s ask, uh, does Britain and the United States, our planners, uh, are they planning, might they be planning at some future time to harm us? And if we decide they are, we'll assassinate them? I mean, that's uh, so outlandish that uh, you can't even comment on it. But since we take for granted that we are the sovereigns, we're the rulers of the world, uh, we have a monopoly on force. Uh, our, we, are not, we are rogue states in the technical sense. We are not subject to law, even our own law or international law. That's all taken for granted. And without having heard the discussion in the British Parliament, I'm willing to wager that it was tacitly taken for granted there too. Well. I think, I hope you could hear there's warm applause for your powerful statement there. I would now like to turn and ask Kit Ashton. Uh, could you give us your question, please? Yeah, if you'd like to, have you got a mic? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Chomsky? Yes, I hear Hi. you. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Good evening or afternoon. Uh, so, can I start by just saying thank you, actually. Um, I'm big fan of your, your work and your activism. I know I'm not alone in the room in that regard. Uh, so, yes, so I'm a local musician and a language activist here in Jersey. Uh, as a linguist, you may be aware that Jersey has its own unique and centuries-old dialect of Norman French, known as Gerier, which is a much-loved element of our cultural identity, but is nevertheless currently critically endangered, having previously suffered an authoritarian repression. Uh, so I'm part of the local effort to safeguard and revitalize Gerier 
I run a folk band called Badlebeck, which sing in Jerrier, and our recordings are used in local schools. Uh, so my question is really very simple, and that is I'd like to ask, could you tell us a little bit about your view on the value and importance of maintaining and revitalizing a language that is so localized and so endangered, and possibly comment on how that might contribute to a deeper sense of cultural identity and help inspire wider community action and, pos and positive social outcomes? Well, the loss of a language, uh, from a linguist's point of view, is of course tragic. It's like the loss of a species for a biologist. You're losing a major uh, a source of uh, information and understanding. But that's the least of it. Uh, there's much more, uh, so like a non-biologist, should also be concerned by the extinction of species. For example, we should all be concerned about the fact that uh, species extinction today is proceeding at a level um, uh, beyond anything for the last 65 million years uh, since uh, an asteroid hit the Earth and uh, caused a massive extinction of species, ended the age of the dinosaurs, uh, gave an option for small mammals to exist, ultimately us. Uh, we're now back to that level of species extinction. Now, the difference is this time we're the asteroid. It's the uh, human impact on destruction of the environment that is leading to this massive extinction of species. That's a problem not just for biologists. The same with the language case. A language is not just uh, sounds that people produce. A language is a a repository of uh, the cultural wealth, of uh, oral traditions, of uh, historical consciousness, of uh, community uh, uh, solidarity, uh, a very rich uh, system of uh, human existence is encapsulated in the language. And when that's lost, the language is lost, all of that is lost with it. Uh, that's a serious uh, uh, a blow to all of us, not just to technical linguists who are losing some of their e e important part of their evidence. So I think there's very strong reason to be concerned at the a very rapid disappearance of languages. Uh, usually this is discussed in terms of indigenous languages, tribal languages, and it's true that they are disappearing quite rapidly. But right in Europe, the languages are disappearing very fast. Uh, one of the areas of most rapid language disappearance in recent generations is right in Europe. Uh, there are plenty of people in Italy, for example, who can't talk to their grandmothers because their grandmothers talk to something which we call a dialect of Italian, but it's actually a completely different language, uh, radically different from uh, conventional Italian. Uh, just to give another illustration about uh, around 1970, a student of mine uh, at MIT, uh, who, who, a, a linguistic student, got his PhD in um, linguistic work on German. And he wanted to go to Germany uh, just to you know, sharpen his linguistic skills uh, after graduation. So he got himself a job in Cologne. His job was uh, teaching at the university. He was teaching German to German students. He was teaching German to student to German native German students because their dialect, their version of German, was sharply different from standard German. Okay, that that's not true any longer. By now, if you go to Cologne, they're speaking standard German. Those languages have disappeared. Now, there are parts of the United States, say in eastern Kentucky, uh, where I've been, where if I walk on the streets, I can't understand what people are saying. And at the university, they have to teach them English, standard English. Well, their languages are disappearing. It's not a huge issue in the en English-speaking areas of the United States. The United States happens to be an extremely homogeneous society, and not for pretty reasons, because the, the reason is the indigenous population was mostly exterminated. Uh, so when you exterminate the population, you end up with something homogeneous. But we're, what were exterminated were huge numbers, thousands of languages, cultures, uh, uh, 
with all that goes with it, the, uh, the richness of the culture, tradition, uh, 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 all of that uh, wealth of uh, cultural wealth and uh, the social significance is all gone. Uh, now, is it worth, is it possible to recover? Yeah, it is. In fact, there's some remarkable illustrations uh, right here where I am, my own department at MIT uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a pretty amazing achievement by a great linguist, uh, Ken Hale, recently died, unfortunately, but a marvelous person and a wonderful linguist. Uh, one of his specialties was American Indian languages. There was a language spoken here, the language that was spoken quite widely here before the English colonists arrived and ultimately destroyed everything. Uh, it was Wampanoag was the language. There still is a Wampanoag tribe, but nobody's spoken the language for 100 years. It was assumed to be lost. Uh, Ken Hale, this uh, faculty member I mentioned, along with some of his students and a member of the Wampanoag tribe, uh, Jessie Little Doe was her name, who came here to be a student. Uh, together, they succeeded in reconstructing the language using comparative evidence from uh, other surviving languages and uh, texts, many of the missionary texts from an earlier period. They reconstructed what is probably a very close facsimile of the original language. The language now has its first native speaker in 100 years, uh, Jesse Little Doe's daughter, who I think is now six or seven years old, and other uh, young children are now learning it. The tribe has been revitalized. It's uh, been an encouragement to their uh, solidarity, uh, self-respect, existence, recovery of traditions, and so on. That contributes to cultural wealth and diversity of a kind that had been wiped out by, I'm afraid, literal extermination, to tell the truth. Um, well, that's an extreme example, but it's happening elsewhere as well. As well. I mean, if you... Uh, I happened to visit Wales about 20 years ago, and I was struck by the fact that uh, children coming out of the schools were talking Welsh. Uh, I, w I visited Catalonia uh, shortly after Franco uh, died. Uh, Catalan, the language of Catalonia, had been banned under Franco. It was an illegal language. No, every, when I was there, every, all I heard was Spanish walk in the streets at the university and so on. Of course, people were speaking Catalan in private, but it was hidden. I came back a couple of years later, all I heard was Catalan. It had revived, and not just the language, a lot more with it. I mean, I happened to be in a hotel which would overlook the central square in Barcelona, this big cathedral and square. And a Sunday morning, I looked out the hotel window, uh, uh, people were gathering in the square. Um, there were uh, musicians on the steps of the cathedral uh, playing traditional Catalan music. They were folk dancing in the square. The uh, cultural traditions that are, had, uh, uh, had revived, it had all come out of the woodwork. Uh, by now, as you know, it's at the point where there's a significant pressure for Catalonian independence. Well, that's also happening in other areas. Uh, I think these are very healthy developments, and it can be done. The Wampanoag case, case is an extreme example, but there are others too. No, uh, I would now like to ask Heather. Heather? Heather, perhaps. Hello, can you hear me? Going on from that independence, uh, I've got a quite appropriate question. Uh, with the Scottish referendum now over, and the majority, although small, in favour of the Union. What advice can you give to the mobilised people who voted yes, but who didn't achieve their dream of independence? And do you anticipate big changes to follow to the UK political system as a result of the referendum in general? Well, you know, it's not up to me to give advice. I should be hearing from them what they think uh, they ought to do and how they're going to do it. Uh, I think there are complicated questions that arise in connection with the uh, uh, independence effort. Uh, I, in fact, have been asked a number of times 
through this period to express a, a judgment and an opinion on it, and I've refrained from doing so because uh, I don't think it's a trivial question. I think there are serious issues involved, and I th without uh, thinking them through carefully and becoming uh, cognizant of the uh, issues and concerns on many sides, I think it would be uh, irresponsible uh, to take a position, so I didn't. Uh, but the people who are committed to Scottish independence, uh, I think, know without my telling them exactly what they should be doing. Uh, they should be uh, uh, carrying out activist programs within their own communities, educational, organizational, uh, uh, active, other acts as appropriate to try to uh, bring their fellow citizens to uh, uh, accept uh, the opinions that they think are valid. I, not my opinion, it's not up to me whether they are or not, but that's the task for any issue. The same if you're interested in uh, main, main, uh, reviving uh, dying languages, or much more dramatically, if you're interested in ending the human scourge, uh, which is destroying species at the rate of 65 million years ago, and is marching towards a precipice where we'll destroy ourselves too. Those are the kinds of things that you have to, the only kinds of advice that can be given. The next questioner is Bram, or I don't think it's Brian, the optimism of the world question. Uh, hello, Mr. Chomsky. It's a big honor to, to address you. Um, I know you've been a dominant voice in linguistics, and that was most of your film uh, was on that area. Um, I've been personally mostly influenced by your, um, your role as social commentator and activist, political activist. And one of the quotes um, that has always stuck with me is your um, optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect, uh, which you have demonstrated, I think, in a number of struggles you've been uh, a part of. Now, um, the other day I read an article from your hand, um, and I had the feeling that the balance was tilted slightly towards the pessimism of the intellect. I think you were talking about the end of human civilization. Um, climate change was the main, um, the main uh, topic. Um, and I'm always inclined to read Mr. Chomsky on current events. Um, and I was just wondering if your um, perception of the world today has been at all affected by the state of the Arab Spring, climate change, and if that balance has indeed tilted towards the pessimism of the intellect rather than the optimism of the will. Well, it just to be clear, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, I can't take credit for that phrase. That was a phrase that uh, Gramsci made famous. It wasn't his either. It was Wilma Roland. But uh, Gramsci made it famous. I think it's a very important concept. We should have, as he emphasized repeatedly, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And I think that's still true. It's true today, too. But you read that article correctly. I think the as the world is proceeding right now, uh, the balance is shifting towards pessimism of the will. That's our choice. It doesn't have to. could go in the other direction, but we're going to have to make a choice. Uh, there are processes underway which are uh, threatening the prospects of decent survival, uh, not in the distant future, uh, for our children and grandchildren. Uh, the, uh, I th unless your head is hidden in the sand, I think these should be familiar. Uh, we are now, uh, 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 so th there was a big, uh, last Sunday, major uh, march in New, New York City, hundreds of thousands of people, other places, uh, uh, calling for action on climate change. The same day, uh, one of the major international monitoring groups uh, produced a report showing that uh, global emissions uh, of uh, greenhouse gases had increased to a, uh, a new high that just the past year, I think it was the year two thir two th uh, 2013, uh, by, I think, 2.3%. Uh, 
and in the United States had increased by 2.9 percent, reversing earlier declines. Uh, uh, another study released the same day, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, estimated the number of uh, super hot days expected in New York City, that's over 90 Fahrenheit, uh, in the next 30 years, said it would probably triple uh, worse in southern climates. Uh, that goes along with rising of the sea level, uh, uh, other deleterious consequences, uh, all right before us. At the same time, uh, the kind of institutional logic of state capitalism, the kind of system we live in, is driving in the opposite direction. So, for example, uh, uh, ExxonMobil, the biggest energy corporation, they recently announced, as the business press put it, I'm quoting them, that they are not going to change their laser-like focus on fossil fuel extraction because that's where the profits are. Uh, another major energy corporation, Chevron, uh, did have a small uh, sustainable energy program, which was pretty successful. It was profitable. Uh, but the profits were not at the level of fossil fuel extraction, uh, so they therefore abandoned it or are now committing themselves to uh, fossil fuel extraction totally. Uh, last time I was in England, a couple of months ago, I guess, uh, at the airport, uh, I picked up the newspaper, I think it was the Daily Telegraph, and there was a big headline announcing that uh, some law had been passed permitting fracking uh, under the individually owned homes uh, without the owner's permission. All efforts to make sure we get the last drop of fossil fuels out of the ground uh, when the scientific consensus is that the majority of those fuels, maybe up to 80 percent of them, had better be left in the ground if we're going to have any hope for decent survival. Well, that's the direction in which we are marching, you know, like the uh, proverbial lemmings uh, heading for the cliff. That's before I rise. Now, it's not that nothing can be done about it. The climate change protests, massive ones on Sunday, were an indication of what can be done. But it's going to have to be done on a significant scale, uh, directed at really core elements of the whole institutional logic of the societies in which we live, which are geared in many ways towards maximization of short-term profit, no matter what the costs. The costs are externalized. The, uh, the corporation, you know, corporations that produce the energy don't, don't pay the costs. Those are externalities in economist terms, so you don't count them. Now, they're costs for the rest of us and for our children and for our grandchildren and for the children in Bangladesh who are going to be wiped out by the millions if the sea level rises because it's a coastal plain, and on and on. Uh, those are really serious issues and by no means the only ones. Uh, the threat of nuclear war is ever-present. No time to go through the record now, but when you look at the history, the fact that we've survived this far is virtually a miracle. There have been near misses so close that it's appalling to think about them. Is anything being done about this? Yeah. Uh, President Obama recently announced uh, new programs uh, to uh, uh, up upgrade U.S. nuclear forces uh, more rapidly than has been done since the early Reagan years. I think a trillion dollars in the next 30 years. That's what's being done. Uh, uh, England the same. Uh, other countries the same. I mean, we are, uh, this is the first time in human history that we really face a choice as to whether to survive or not. It's not just the, the destruction of species at the rate of 65 million years ago. Uh, we're coming next. And if you look around the world, there is opposition. In fact, kind of ironically, the leading opposition to this, the cutting edge of it, is the indigenous societies around the world, the tribal societies, uh, the, uh, the First Nations in Canada, the uh, uh, 
uh, aboriginals in Australia, the tribal people in India. The, it's dramatic in South America where the, unlike North America, where the English colonists came, in South America, much of the indigenous population uh, was not exterminated, it still exists. Uh, in Bolivia, there's an indigenous majority and they have actually put into uh, uh, the, the basic constitutional structure provisions for rights of nature, which are rights that have to be preserved in accordance with traditional cultures, uh, quite apart from our right to have more commodities in our, po in, in our homes. Uh, Ecuador, another country with a large indigenous population under their pressure, it's an oil producing country, uh, did offer to keep its oil in the ground where it ought to be at a huge cost to them if the European countries, the rich countries, would fund a small fraction of the loss that they incur by not lifting oil. Well, the rich countries refused, uh, so now they're lifting oil. Uh, uh, things like this are happening around the world. Uh, when you look at them, you can see reasons for optimism, flickers of light, uh, but pessimism of the will is hard to avoid when you look at how, at the choices we are making, not other people, we are making and uh, are continuing to make in the face of uh, a very severe threats to decent survival. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave. I have another interview waiting for me right now. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, all I can say, Nam, is you've spoken to us wonderfully and at, at considerable length. So we're, we're very grateful to you giving up time to come and speak to us. Uh, and I think we all found the interview as well as the, uh, the film very stimulating. So thank you very much. And Andrew, sorry, one second, guys, please. Um, just uh, before we leave, I have a couple of announcements here. Um, park shut at 9 p.m., but